Well, as the effects of global warming upset our weather patterns, the results are affecting the landscape, plants, and animals of our national parks, including many right here in California. What, if anything, can be done by the National Park Service to mitigate the effects of climate change? Climate Watch senior editor Craig Miller sat down with National Parks director John Jarvis to find out. John Jarvis, thanks for taking some time with us. Thank you. It's great you to be here. You and I first met last fall up in Glacier National Park. You were talking to a group of reporters on a creek, and you said the greatest threat to the integrity of the national park system that you've ever faced is climate change. That's a huge statement. Yeah, well, I believe every bit of it. Uh, and Glacier National Park is the perfect place to do that, besides being a beautiful place. Glacier is sort of the poster child for climate change. Um, uh, based on all the predictive models we see within a couple of decades, the glaciers that define Glacier National Park will uh, literally be gone. And glaciers store water. They provide uh, a refrigerator service uh, basically for free for streams that support uh, uh, wild uh, trout and other species, and all of that is gonna change. So the basic integrity for our national parks is, is being challenged by climate change. Uh, California has a huge stake in this. I think I counted more than 20 parks, monuments. 25. 25, yeah, you know the exact number. Um, Joshua trees, uh, according to a recent report from the U.S. Geological Survey, likely to disappear from 90% of their current range by the end of the century. I think that includes Joshua Tree Joshua National Tree. Park. Right. You can't just pick up a park and move it, right? So no, nor can nor will Joshua trees migrate on their own either. Um, so we are deeply concerned about, you know, the the purposes for which the national parks were established uh, were to preserve a piece of natural wildness. Um, and our mantra, our core values, has been about preserving these places unimpaired for future generations. And yet now we are actually seeing impairment to these basic components of the system driven by climate change. So how do you, how do you attack a challenge like that? What's the counteroffensive to something that you basically can't change? Well, I think the National Parks Service has a unique role in climate change. Um, and I can kind of click them off. One is uh, basic science. We are perfect laboratories to really understand climate change and its effects and its rate um, because these are the few places that have been set aside and are at least relatively natural in their current state. The second piece is we're an opportunity for education to actually show the American public um, the effects of climate change that we're literally seeing on the ground right now. The great thing about uh, parks as our visitors are repeat visitors. So, you know, if you go visit your 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 cousins and you'll see their kids, you know, go over like 10 years, you know, every time you see them they get another foot taller or whatever. People come back to national parks repeated and they we can actually see the change within their visit framework. I so, want to talk about that. Yeah, too. Like, so that that's yeah. a perfect opportunity for education. The the third piece is really uh, mitigation. The National Park Service itself can reduce its own carbon footprint and at the same time demonstrate that to the American public. And <laughs> it's hard to imagine the parks have a huge carbon footprint, you know, we don't, it's a very small part of the problem. We don't, but we can be an exemplar. We can demonstrate how to reduce carbon footprint. So what are you seeing on the ground right now and what are you doing about it? Well, for instance, um, uh, in, uh, in the Sierras, um, we're seeing a lengthening of the fire seasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, they start earlier and they burn later and they also burn more intensely. And when you get fire burning with higher intensity, you, you begin to change the ecology. And as a result, some new species come in. Buffalo grass in the, in the Southwest is an example of an invasive species. It's flashy and it can um, it can cause increased frequency of fires, which result in, uh, you know, death of Joshua trees or other species. And this isn't a blip. You think this is a, a symptom of, of, of systemic, ongoing climate change? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, we can correlate uh, the changes, uh, like, for instance, in the Cascades, in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Olympic, those kinds of, uh, the northern tier, we've seen a very, um, well-documented shift in rain on snow, which would typically happen in the spring. Historically, it's just been a positive trend. You have these big snow packs, it rains in the spring. 
the snow is so big, it's like a big sponge. It just sort of soaks up all that rain and then lets it out through the spring, which is essential to, you know, not only the environment, but agriculture communities down below, uh, potable water systems. That rain is now happening in the fall instead of the spring. Very uh, documented, scientifically based shift. And the result is there's no snowpack, so it's just heavy rains and it's washing out systems, washing out millions of dollars of infrastructure, road systems, all of that. So we're really beginning in our planning process to plan for climate change plan for sea level rise, where we locate facilities, what kind of facilities we put in uh, as we replace those that are lost as a result of this kind of damage is all part of our planning agenda for parks. And you mentioned money. Um, this is not going to be cheap to try to, 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 to do this kind of adaptation and mitigation. Here in California, you know, we, you, we hear biologists using the term species triage, you know, trying to actually pick winners and losers, which ones we're going to save. We're starting to do that with parks here in California. Can you foresee a day when we may have to face that with national parks as well? Well, I think the key, uh, one of the keys to, um, to uh, the concerns about climate change at the landscape scale is connectivity. Uh, we need to look at the landscape slightly differently than we have. We've always partitioned our landscape and say, you know, this is private, this is agriculture, this is protected. But now we need to be thinking about how they integrate. Um, that if species are going to move, and they are moving now, right. um, they need corridors, they need paths in order to get from this place to this place. Now ultimately we may have to get to what's called assisted migration. If there's a species, you know, let's, uh, let's say it's a, a pica, which is a, you know, wonderful little um, Whistle Rabbit pig, relative, right? Whistle looks, pig, uh, looks or like a, a cartoon uh, Tom and Jerry uh, character. Exactly, yeah. and uh, they're fantastic little creatures that live in the Sierras. Um, they are literally moving up. Mm -hmm. You know, we have that well documented that climate change is driving them higher and higher in the mountain. Well, ultimately, you get to the top, you don't have any place to go. Right. Um, but mountains in the north may be able to support those populations, and so we really have to work with academia with all the land management agencies, Forest Service, Park Service, BLM, state parks and all of that to look at how we can build in resilience and redundancy in these natural systems so that they can make it into the future. It's a huge challenge. I want to let you get back to it. <laughs> Thanks for taking a few minutes out for us. Oh, thank you very much. It's great. Wow, sounds like they really have their work cut out for them. Thanks for coming in today, Rachel, Wyatt, Anna. Appreciate it. Have a great weekend. All right.